Okay, so our lesson for yin yoga. So, okay, so one key thing is we start to look at these, at these different presentations is you might see a class where it's restorative yoga and it reminds you of yin or vice versa. And essentially what yin does is it brings the body out of anatomical alignment beyond anatomical alignment. And when it does that, it further stretches the connective tissue and therefore increases flexibility, which sounds great in theory, but I don't know that I'm personally a fan. So since what we really focus on here at EDGE and yoga teacher training is be in alignment, be in alignment, and we follow the Kamenoff lineage, I do still feel that there's quite a, a number of benefits to yin that can be found, but we stop at the point before we move out of alignment, right? So that might even mean that we're paying a little bit more attention to those qualities. We're advancing the postures and movements a little bit more. And if that's happening, then we might see uh, an increase in flexibility due to connective tissue. So if we have the muscle, we can strengthen the muscle, we can get a nice healthy muscle, but essentially the muscle is encapsulated. Here's my, uh, my view. Okay, if we have the muscle fibers inside and that muscle is encapsulated by connective tissue around, no matter what we do, the muscle will only get so big unless we stretch that connective tissue to create space for expansion. So that can be one way of looking at what connective tissue does, um, the role it plays in enhancing uh, muscular gain uh, and benefits along those lines, it, along with the flexibility piece so that we can have the range of motion and so on. Um, so a, a brief history on yoga, a yin yoga, and I believe that Kara will be doing yin yoga class tonight at seven, so you guys can look forward to that. So we will take a little break uh, between um, the end of this lesson and the start of that lesson, just so you guys can catch your breath, get ready, get your math and so on. Uh, all right. So essentially yin yoga was originated in the 1980s by Paul Grilly is accredited as being the founder of this practice. So, you know, commonly when we think of yoga, we think, oh, yoga is so old. The only people that have an impact on yoga are the, you know, present day practitioners and teachers of yoga. And it's just simply not true. Um, to add to that idea, Shiva Ray has had a huge impact on yoga and moon salutations and bringing yoga to the feminine body and building the pelvic floor and so on. So I do believe that teachers continue present day and that there's, there's an honor and space to be held there. Uh, I would say for me, I've had a number of teachers over the years come to the studio and offer yin yoga. And many of the students would say that they found so much mindfulness in that class, in that practice. And that's, that's what was so alluring about the yin yoga. Um, it's also challenging. So if you're really, um, refined in your knowledge of the postures, you can share what's happening within their body and entertain them as they're holding these postures for a good long while. Um, it could be seven, eight minutes that someone's holding a posture, right? So I've been, um, I, I took Darcy's in yoga class uh, kind of frequently, and we'd be holding that warrior one and like, I'm like, oh, this is great. And then we're still holding the warrior one. I'm like, oh, this is still going on. We're still holding the warrior one and so on. So <clears throat> keeping this in mind that if we can help our practitioners remain engaged by entertaining them, we are entertainers as well as educators, as well as instructors. And even if that is in regards to our own personal practice. So keep, a, keep some of these things in mind. Um, if, if we look to how we can move the body with ease and control, and if you've got the slides, uh, the, the PowerPoint in front of you, you can kind of you can kind of read through these as time goes on. Cara does a really nice uh, job of researching her information for her PowerPoints. So that if you hunger for that granular learning piece and the history in the background, it's really all there. And then come on over to training and get the broad strokes ideas. So in that way, I hope to provide the notes for you so that instead of fervently writing down notes and perhaps even feeling frustration, rather just 
allow yourself to embody the information and maybe apply it in a way that's meaningful to you. And then we'll change, you know, from one person to the next and so on. All right, so let's take a look, Sierra. Um, so generally speaking, yin yoga is categorized as a gentle style of yoga, but I don't know that I would offer a yin yoga and name it gentle yoga. So when we talk about how to name your class, I think it's really important that we're clear in what the name of the class is, and we're clear in what the description of the class is, and that we try not to use words such as advanced or beginner or intermediate, because what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? If you tell me gentle style of yoga, I'm expecting quite a bit of rest. Uh, so with yin yoga, I personally feel that that is, although it is categorized as a gentle style of yoga in that it's not athletic in nature, it doesn't necessarily raise the heart rate, right? Um, there's no great benefits to it as far as you know, weight loss, the way vinyasa flow might do. So it is, is in line with gentle style of yoga in that way, uh, but you'll, you'll be working. To be sure, you'll be working. So I might um, call my yin class um, maybe gentle stillness yoga. And then in the description, make sure I highlight that we're going to be holding postures and that modifications and alternative postures and sister poses will be given. And I would talk about that in the description so that when folks are trying to decide, is this right for me? Uh, sometimes building up the confidence for the student to show up and come, is this right for me? Is, is giving enough of a description where folks know what they're coming for but not so much that you're locked in, you know, depending on who shows up that day to the room. So if you say it's going to be one thing and these people show up and it's not fitting for them, you wanna be able to maneuver through your class plan to deliver to the audience in front of you what it is they're looking for. Um, so let's see, so we're basically holding full poses anywhere from three to 10 minutes at a minimum. Uh, some uh, benefits to this, is um, feeding the soft muscle tissue, replenish blood flow, and even release deeply held emotion and or tension stored within the body. So let's build on that, let's talk about that. Um, sometimes these conversations are discredited because they're delivered in a flowery way. And it's not that I don't like flowery language. I do. I do like that in class. When I personally take a yoga class, I want my instructor to just like sprinkle with me with flowers and sunshine. I, I really do. But it's important as teachers that we know and we understand and that we deliver to them the anatomy behind why that is. So if we live at a very stressful pace, then our cortisol levels might be really high. And then in turn, that might throw off or impact our liver. So most of us have a liver, right? If we're in a yoga class, we have a liver in common. And so if there's stores of the chemical remnants from the hormonal actions or from the chemistry behind the hormonal system, being stored in our muscle tissue or in our organs, whatever it might be, that's going to impact our overall health. So in that way, if you can wrap your brain, you know, brain around the idea, if we can store it, then it, it, it stands to reason that we can release it. Right, so if we can store it, we can release it. If we can store it, we can release it. So just consider it in that way. And so if we're holding a posture, right, and say we're in a twist, we are wringing our innards out. And if we're just moving through it really quickly, it may not really have a chance to, to have an experience of that release and so on, right? So these are some of the benefits to helping your practitioners or even, you know, you understand why, why a practice like this would be a benefit and why vinyasa flow isn't necessarily the end all be all when it comes to yoga, right? Like each, each style of yoga has its own right in its position and perhaps maybe even you create your own style of yoga. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, all right. So it's unique from other styles of yoga because the long poses are held. Um, I often see the term passive used to describe this, this style, Kara writes. So 
passive implies, I think, easy, um, but it's not in that what we're doing is we're moving into a posture, say the warrior one, and we're moving into uh, that knee coming down. And maybe as the minutes flip by and the, the, the clock continues to tick, we find a deepening of the posture, but it's not in a move your knee forward actively um, cognitive way. It's your body settling into itself and allowing it to move into what it's capable of doing. So it's really important that you understand this one reason why the lesson's first on yin and the practice second. It's really important that you understand what your body can do and what feel good in your body and that you're listening to the cues from your body as they come. So when people think about pain, pain is good. We want pain. Pain is the body's way of saying, woohoo, hey, 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 let's, let's back off. Let's slow down. Let's recover, right? That's, that's the intention behind it. We have chronic pain that usually yields chronic inflammation. And, and that becomes a a pain inflammation cycle that can be very, very hard to break out of. So we wanna keep an eye on it and move in small measures over time and not try to push into something just because we want it, right? So that the ego wants us to push into something just because we want it, uh, but we don't want to do that so much. We want to, um, we want to move into things and allow our body to settle in. And yin does that because it gives you time to do that. Where maybe you can smidge in a little bit more. Maybe you can soften the shoulders and integrate a pranayama. And maybe there we are releasing some of the tightness in the hips that has less to do with the connective tissue or has less to do with the muscle structure and has more to do with the state of mind, right? And so letting go, that's a huge thing. Um, so considering that, um, so Kara here, she mentions frog or even pigeon for deep hip bone openers. This is lovely. For my frog, what I like to do is use a bolster and put a bolster um, on my chest just to, um, to, give, to give my hips a little bit more grace. I can get more done with frog. I also can get done more with frog on one side and then the other. And then both, then if I just try to go into both, I can get more work done personally that way. You might find the same. Um, with my pigeons, I like to take the bolster and put it under my forearm. And then again, just bringing the floor to me, it extends a little more grace in my hips, which tend to be high, tight, 